I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevnik. Welcome to Creek Devil. Welcome to the Q&A, everyone. I have a couple things to say before we get started. First of all, uh, we are still working on the Mr. Black audio, so we're hoping to have that uh, a little clearer for the next posting, number three. So stand by for that. We'll have it out shortly. We're working on it. And I'm still looking for families of missing people that have disappeared under strange circumstances. Uh, it's not for a book project or the show or anything like that. We want to have a private conversation with family members. And uh, we think we can provide some more exposure for the missing person. So get a hold of me at wjevning at gmail.com. That's W-J-E-V-N-I-N-G at gmail. And let's discuss this. So Milo's with us today. Always appreciate having him. It's been a while since he's been here. So I also wanted to say that if you enjoy the show, we could really use the likes because that helps YouTube get the uh, show out to other people, more exposure. So if you could hit the like button, we'd really appreciate that. And, uh, and if you're not a subscriber, we'd appreciate you being a subscriber. We'd love to have uh, more exposure for the show and for more listeners. So let's get started. So, Tom, let's go ahead and jump into the questions. Sure, you bet. Okay. Uh, first question is from a gentleman named Derek. He sounds like he's just getting into this. He says he would like to know if a newbie just beginning to get into the Bigfoot research, going into the woods, etc., can discover valuable information about Bigfoot that would be useful for other researchers to use and possibly build from. Yeah, I think so. The first thing to do is get my, my book, Bigfoot Fieldwork 101, and then that'll get you started. Yeah, absolutely. Shameless, shameless plug there. <laughs> shameless, totally shameless plug. Yes. <laughs> what, what do you What do you guys think, though? What are your opinions? Let's go around the table. Your opinions on that? Okay, I think you know whether you've been doing it like you have for close to fifty years, or you started last week. Uh, everybody's got uh, kind of an equal. Um, Everybody's equally welcome. Everybody's equally valid to get into it. It's a fun thing to do. Um, stay safe. You want to, whether you're researching Bigfoot or elk or anything out in the woods, I would say uh, never go alone. And uh, it's an interesting topic. To me, all information is good as long as you got open mind. So the more you know or I don't think there's one specific way of learning how to track this down because every time you do it, it's going to be different anyway. Forrest, what do you think? Yeah. Well, oh, there you go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Thanks a lot. My, uh, behave, Milo. <laughs> <laughs> um, with my instance, uh, it seems Bigfoot found me rather than me going out finding Bigfoot, but. Uh, Regardless of that, I think that, um, you know, just a um, basic structured, uh, you know, plan out what you're planning on doing and uh, stay safe, definitely. I would go armed and I would never go out there by myself. I mean, uh, at least one or two people accompanying you. So um, I don't think that uh, uh, in any situation, whether you're tracking grizzlies or uh, elk or deer or whatever, you know, you should always be careful and uh, safe. And you know, with this subject, I agree with that. You know, with this subject, <laughs> you never know. You never know what you're going to come across, and so it really doesn't matter if someone is, you know, well seasoned or if they're brand new, uh, because anybody could trip across something that could be very valid. Okay, Tom. Exactly. Next question. All right. 
Um, I don't know who wrote this one, but they wanted to know about uh, Bigfoot teeth. What is known about Bigfoot teeth? Do they have the same number as humans, uh, 32? And I've heard that they have two rows. And I want to comment on this in just a second, that they have double rows of teeth. Uh, has this ever been seen? And what about juveniles and baby teeth? Do other primates have a primary set of teeth and shed like humans? Has this been seen with Bigfoot? Um, and I want to talk about the double row of teeth because I I read something on this a while back. And a lot of people think a double row of teeth means you got a row of teeth on, on the uppers, and then on the uppers, you got another row inside, and same thing on your lowers. That's not what it means. What it means is, well, it's going to be a shock, but I got a double row of teeth. So does Forrest, so does Milo, so does we all do. It just means a double row of teeth means you have uppers and lowers. And that was the way Dennis would describe teeth back in the day, back, I think, like back in the early 1900s, 1800s. <coughs> um, so forth. I don't know. Forrest, what are your thoughts? Well, strangely enough, uh, somebody questioned me about this once upon a time, and I actually went on a mission to look it up. Um, you know, whether you want to call it double rolls of teeth or, or what, um, there are people that actually occur in the human population that do have um, multiple rows of teeth they will have a set on the outside just like what's normal for us and then they will have <clears throat> a set on the inside growing um, it's very very rare but it does occur um, i have never seen this or ever heard of it occurring in any other type of primates other than humans um, all primates have baby teeth just like any other mammals have baby teeth and they lose them and then they grow in permanent teeth. Uh, the canines are usually the last to come in. Uh, this is uh, true in the majority of all primates because uh, those teeth are used in uh, monkeys and apes as a defense mechanism and so uh, the reason they're, they're the last to grow in is because you're going to have to have the body to possess uh, those type of canines to back up basically if you're showing your canines to uh, you know as a defense mechanism you're going to have to have the body to back that up so that is the last to uh, come in in your primate groups and now uh, we, I know that uh, Will has talked about some Bigfoot having pronounced canines and then others having big blocky teeth like chiclets. Um, you know, all primates have big canines, um, but they also, uh, your uh, gorillas and chimps have uh, a dentition almost identical to humans. So, um, so I don't think anybody's ever discovered uh, teeth owing to a, uh, a Bigfoot. So, uh, I mean, we have teeth for Gigantopithecus, Blackie, but, uh, and they're big, big, large, big, large uh, teeth. So I would assume, I'm assuming because of the size of Bigfoot that they would have uh, larger dentition as well. You, you know, it made me think of an old saying when you talked about, you know, the, the canines grow in later because you need the body size. That sort of, Along the lines of the saying, uh, you know, don't let your alligator mouth overload your canary backside. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. But, but yeah. yeah, that's that's well, what I... I always, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I always thought the when they talk about these giants that they find and they have double rows of uh, teeth, I actually thought that's got to be a bunch of malarkey. And I looked it up and kind of went and pulled some books and stuff. And I actually even talked to my dentist, and he said that it does occur in the human population. It's very, very rare, but it does occur. Is it a mutation or some sort of a, um, like a, you know, genetic uh, carryover or what? Any thoughts on that? 
Well, I don't know what it would be a carryover from because I've never seen any type of, uh, in paleoanthropology, any type of uh, finds where they have, that has shown up. So I would assume that uh, it's a mutation and whether or not they've actually been able to single out the gene that uh, causes that, I have no idea. I'd have to plead ignorance on that. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a number of anomalies that do happen in people periodically, you know, not just teeth like that, but there are plenty of other examples. So I, I suppose it's not unheard of. But as a rule, right. but as a rule of thumb, let's say for the Sasquatch, they probably don't. They probably have teeth very similar to ours. For the, oh, I would assume so. Yes. For the exception, and and like I said, you know, there's of the two major groupings. One grouping has the blocky teeth and and the small, non-pronounced canine like ours, uh, because we have canines also, and then there's the others that are very pronounced canines. Okay, so I just want to go. I want to make sure we tackle every question here because I did sort of, I kind of jumped the gun a little bit. Okay, so do we know? Do they have the same number of teeth as humans? Well, there's no way of knowing it. Nobody's ever come up with a skull or a mandible or anything else. So, uh, uh, you know, I'm going to assume that they would uh, would have the same number of teeth uh, as we do in uh, other primates. There's, a, there's slight variations between uh, primates, but uh, uh, basically it's all the same. So, uh, Well, for us, that's actually that a good, good being point. a primate, they would probably be the same way. So do chimps have 32 teeth? You know, I've never counted them, but I'm going to, now that you <laughs> say something, I'm going to look that up. But, uh, I mean, they have basically the same uh, formation in the teeth, you know, two, two uh, incisors uh, upper, I mean, excuse me, four incisors upper and uh, top and bottom, uh, the two, two canines uh, top and bottom, uh, two premolars, and then uh, the, uh, so, but the thing is, are you counting with, uh, they don't have what we have, like uh, wisdom teeth that come in. So, um, you know, if you're counting that as uh, part of the, the 32, then uh, know that they would, uh, those might be different. But I'm, I'm going to look that up because, you know what, that's not something that I ever actually. Yeah, I think. I think I recall exactly. from I think I recall from my I haven't been the inclined mind. <laughs> yeah, I want to say from my coursework years ago they talked about uh, chimps and gorillas having and it, it's it's wasn't the exact number but it was very close and I can't remember if they were one or uh, uh, two two or four less or more I think it was less than what we have. Well, are the wisdom teeth part of the thirty two? Um, some, I don't recall. For some people, it actually is. Right. Okay. And then the last question that this person has is, are the large canines uh, seen on some of the Bigfoot types, are they limited to the males, or do both sexes have it? Any any thoughts? Uh, from what I've heard, I, I think both sexes have them in the ones that have the pronounced ones. Okay. Very good question. We actually have some really excellent questions this week. Um, Skyler, Skyler, Will, we know who Skyler is. Yes, we uh, do. <laughs> Hi, Will, Tom, and Forrest, and Milo. Here's a couple of questions I thought I'd ask for the podcast. Uh, if someone was to encounter scat or hair in the wilderness, would either of these items be worth collecting? And what would be the best method of collection and preservation? And he's got another question, but let, we'll answer this one first. Forrest, what do you think? I'm sorry. Uh, we were talking about the preservation of scat. And, and hair. Well, and or hair. Yeah. If someone were to encounter scat or hair in the wilderness, okay. would you, um, would you, take you a consider either of one of these? Where it was? I mean, if you could, or would that be, you know? Well, go ahead, Ma. Uh, I was thinking more like, you know, in relationship to where it was on the ground. I mean, if it was like hair... Was it like eight feet high? Was it in the trees and the bushes? You know, I understand the scat, but I mean, I would like to take pictures of where it was in relationship to where I found it. Oh, absolutely. If it was me. Absolutely. You want to document it before you do anything with it. Yeah. 
that's a good i even even more take field notes and stuff with it well hey i was here at this point and wrote it down and i took a picture of it at you know yeah I had, that's what i would well anytime you're going out in the field to do such as that you need to have uh, equipment that you're carrying with you that uh that you have set aside just for that you know <clears throat> mm-hmm. that would be sterile uh, such as uh, tweezers or something uh, or something of that sort that you could pick it up with. Uh, uh, you'd need to carry sterile gloves uh, and uh, Ziploc bags that... Uh, oh, um, let me let me back are, up a little bit there. Yeah. What you don't want is Ziploc because the plastic, the fumes that plastic gives off can alter the, the uh, mm. organic material. What you want to use is sterile white paper like an envelope. Uh, okay. Well, see now, uh, we used to use, uh, Ziploc bags for putting stuff in. Well, I, I <laughs> so found I, this out. I was not even aware of yeah, that. I so found this I, out. I have learned something new. I found yeah. it out years ago <laughs> with a, a, a guy that I used to go to the field with and, and he was pretty knowledgeable in those kinds of things. And, and I took some Ziploc bags with me and he says, oh no, you don't want to use that. I said, how come? He says, well, plastic can get it, give off fumes that will alter organic material uh or infect it you know so the results would be off so he says what you want to use is just plain white bleached paper because that's sterile and it won't affect uh whatever material you collect it in you know or uh, i used to carry also i used to get these little uh they kind of look like test tubes sterile glass uh with cork and the cork is uh also uh, something that doesn't affect organic materials. Okay, yeah, so well, here's a question. Was, uh, perfect, perfect, yeah. How big of a envelope are you going to need? <laughs> to put the poop in? <laughs> right. Know, Tom, you don't put poop in an envelope unless you're sending it to somebody you don't like. <laughs> you're going to need a Safeway bag. <laughs> no. Oh, heaven. So well, how about like evidence bags? That's would when that work? I mean, what's, in handy. <laughs> what's the difference between an evidence bag and a plastic bag? I mean, well, that... again, the plastic, you know, it the, it gives off, it can give off fumes depending on you know the manufacturer, I suppose. Great, it goes off my sandwich. But meat. well, but <laughs> I, I think some of the forensic kits actually have um, paper bags. Uh huh. Huh. Well, now that you say that, you know, when you're watching uh, some of these uh, uh, forensic shows, uh, they do actually use like um, um, paper bags that, uh, like lunch bags. So exactly. that might be something there, you know. But I, I, you know, that that we always, I'm not lying, we always use Ziploc bags when we were in the field in archaeology. I don't think any of us were ever aware, and I certainly wasn't. And <laughs> you just told me now that there was a a problem with plastic bags yeah. no one had ever said anything to me at all i, I ever, wasn't ever ever i wasn't aware of I, it either i've been practicing in stupidity <laughs> <laughs> well it depends I, you know there's a lot of things in life it really depends on who you come across with their knowledge set you know because every everybody has different things they've experienced so i just happened to come across and, and work with a guy who who was familiar with all that uh, the forensic stuff and and he explained some of these things to me, so I changed my methods of, you know, how I was operating, doing things, and and, and I would say even for things like here, what what you want to do is carry a, you know, carry a micro. Um, um, I can't think of the word. I'm I've been up since three a.m. Magnifying so glass. A magnifying glass, exactly. Carry a magnifying glass, and and if you, and I do this for the for the trees, the ones that are broken, the territorial markings. And, and Tom will tell you, you've seen me do it. He'll spend time in the field up, my face is right up on, on the tree trunk, examining every inch of it, looking. Because you're not going to find just big tufts of hair on a tree from a Sasquatch. You might find some individual strands, you know, if they happen to brush up against it or something like that. Uh, and that's where you want to have a sterile, sterile tweezers. But the magnifying glass is, you know, very useful. You know, you're out there, you might... You know, you look like uh, you're, you're the inspector out there looking at stuff, but you know what? It's a very useful tool, and it's just a little thing you want to keep in your 
uh, pocket because uh, that's how sometimes you know you look at something with your naked eye and you might not see anything but pull the magnifying glass out and really get close to the tree trunk and, and you can very well come across hair that's really interesting because i then i wonder if you could get like latent palm prints or whatever off of stuff like that well i've got pictures that people have sent me tom tom you even had prints on your truck i i don't know how many prints oh, yeah. i have photographs of from all across the country mm-hmm. where there's either hand prints with finger uh finger prints on them one truck in fact a guy sent me in one side of the truck it had had hand prints fingerprints on it and his brother-in-law was a actually a a senior crime scene investigator for a major city uh who prepared the prints they took photographs of them but before he could lift the prints it rained uh, but at least we had the photographs. But on the other side of the truck, there was a nose smudge. <laughs> An oily a nose, nose smudge. Yeah, where it put its face up on the glass. Wow. So, yeah, I, there, I have plenty of pictures of stuff like that. So, yeah, absolutely. So do you have... Well, what I was gonna, I was going to say about the, uh, the, the poop part, uh, when you're uh, testing poop like that, you need to actually uh, pull multiple samples out of that because uh, you want to try to pull off something from where the end of the the last part of the poop comes out and uh, then you want something from the middle part and then you want something if you can get to it uh, that would come would have been that first came out Uh, that would be the the best way to provide any type of uh, DNA because the cells actually slough differently in uh, the different parts of the the poop sections. Yeah, it's picking up the DNA off the lining off of your large intestine, right? Yes, yes. Now, that's a fairly expensive test to have done, though, isn't it? Oh, heavens, I don't know. I mean, uh, I never... Uh, was involved in in the cost now uh, I mean I never had it personally done from you know from my perspective but uh, uh, you know when I was going to school they all <laughs> the school handled all the costs of that so I, I would imagine that it's not a cheap test no I, I know that you remember we talked about the uh, the deputy sheriff who took the blood sample off the kid's bike and and ran it in for the cheap test you know the twenty dollar test and it was gone for a year and came back and the the sheriff called him in and demanded to know why their department were spending forty thousand dollars for this comprehensive dna test (laughs) yeah he wasn't a happy camper and the poor deputy says why you know that wasn't what i put it in for the lab made the mistake so i i think they're fairly prohibitive cost-wise i mean you know it's a part of this hair and scat are definitely a part of the subject um, but their value, I mean, I think that goes back to the question, um, could be negligible just because of the prohibitive cost, you know, of having the test done. Well, and it's so easy to have cross-contamination too. So, I, I was just uh, you know, that's that. you, have to, you just have to be so, so, so careful. And then, you know, you go through and spend all this money having the test done and then find out that everything was due to cross-contamination. I mean, that's, Another, and I uh, can tell you, I've seen many you know, people have gone with me to the field. They find a hair, you know, whether it was Bigfoot hair or not, they thought it was, and just stuff it in their shirt pocket with their hands. Yeah. And I thought, well, yeah. that's it's worthless now. And then you wonder why some of these samples come up with human DNA all the time. Showing a- absolutely. Up on them, so. Absolutely. So, Tom, where are we at? Did, did we answer all the okay. portions well, of that question? Or? Okay, we're still with Skylar. Okay. And Skylar says, in the uh, unlikely event that somebody was to come across a freshly dead Sasquatch or even a piece of one, would there be any piece of the body worth collecting and preserving? And if so, which piece and why? Such a thing were to occur, um, who, would you, who would you take it to? Who, who would you present well, it to for uh you know, for disclosure of faith, look at what call, we found. Call me. I know where to. I know where to take it. We have scientists. Okay. We have scientists. Okay. Uh, and so the other part of the question is, um, is it worth collecting, and which part? Well, I don't know. Forrest, what do you think about a, a body part? Well, 
as crazy as it might sound, I'd look the head first. I was thinking that, but you'd need a chainsaw. <laughs> well, well, no, uh, it depends how long it's been dead. Very strong man with an axe. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, that would be the first thing I'd want. I mean, a head can tell you so much about an individual. Oh, true. I mean, true. Uh, because you have the look teeth at and all everything. your ancient, ancient finds, you've got, uh, you know, the t- the head can tell so much. I mean, the dentition as far as uh, um, what they ate, how they ate, and uh, age and everything else. And the skull can, oh, I mean, it's just a myriad of things that can be told. And I just, uh, I did go in there and I did verify it's 32 to 236 on uh, primates. That's so, what it was. I, I yeah, knew it was a little bit. Same, di- all in the same field. Yeah, I knew it was a little bit of difference, but not too much. One of the things yeah, I wanted to well, mention. I, too, but I, wasn't, I wasn't exactly sure because it wasn't something that I have necessarily yeah. made a. Uh, study on one of the things i want to mention too for people if there's a biological sample you found that you were pretty sure was bigfoot related um and i'm I'm not sure hair would fall into that unless you had you know the roots but as far as preservation goes you want to freeze that stuff because it'll last longer between the time you collect it and whenever you take it to get tested hmm you don't think freezing would damage anything? No, not typically. At least that's what I was told, so. Okay. Well, we want to put it to the test. <laughs> we just got to go find it. <laughs> I had poop I brought back one time and put it in our freezer. My girlfriend at the time was not very happy about that. <laughs> 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 oh gosh, maybe maybe this is the reason she's a former girlfriend. <laughs> mm, for there are possibilities there. <laughs> I'd be like me going out and picking up squatches, poop out in the yard and put it in a freezer, and Jeannie see it. Yeah, that would be about. Yeah, I don't see me doing that. <laughs> okay, Tom, did we answer everything for Skyler? Okay. That was okay. So those are the questions Skylar has. All right, thanks, Skylar. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, a couple of questions. Um, this person has heard us mention on a recent show that our main goal was to prove the existence of Bigfoot uh, to the public. Does that ultimately require tracking down and killing one uh, to obtain a definite specimen? And what would be the main way to prove it finally? Well, I can tell you, most scientists would say that's what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to one on the, have one on the slab. And I've, I've spoken to a few, especially you know our friend John, who's a forensic anthropologist, and without batting an eye, that was his response. He said it's not it's not unheard of. You know, it's very routine in in uh, science to do that to take a specimen to you know prove their validity well that's what it takes okay well, uh what do you yeah, think happens the what's that for us no i just said that would be the only way to prove it i think we're at that point it's it's probably the you know that's where the line is drawn i think you know for it to be concrete in everybody's minds but that I think it would be a chore. But that doesn't mean, a... yeah, that doesn't mean for anybody just to go out and try to do that because you got to contend with the rest of the group. So you might take a pot shot at one, the rest of them are going to have you for lunch. <laughs> okay, next question is, same person, what do you think happens to the science world and broader society once it's been conclusively proven? Hmm. That's a good question. I don't think I could give any one answer. What do you all think? Well, well yeah. I think the product will get, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, I think it's kind of hard to predict. I th- here's my thoughts. It's just my opinion. I think it would be very exciting at first. And I think it would be sort of like the moon landing. There would be a lot of initial excitement. And then it would kind of become normal with the exception that... <laughs> The moon landing, we come back, you know, okay, great. You know, 12 guys went to the moon. 
here they're still with us it's still going to be in every uh, day-to-day thing in the areas where their creatures um live so why does jurassic park come to mind at first there's right? oohs and ahs then there's running and screaming screaming <laughs> yes <laughs> well the i i think it's going to <clears throat> i view it kind of like the uh ufo situation where for so many years uh, since <clears throat> I can remember being a little girl that people always said that if uh, the, the general public was made aware that UFOs actually really exist, that we were all going to go crazy and, and there'd be riots in the streets and uh, all the Bible thumpers would be losing their little minds. And, and then what happened this year, lo and behold, <clears throat> I mean, it was hardly a passing. Uh, <laughs> but it I mean, I, I hardly heard anybody say anything about it. Okay, yeah, well, now the uh, Department of Defense and uh, the United States but it wasn't uh, really... military and government has all said, yeah, we, we, we now admit that UFOs, however... But it wasn't really official UFOs, disclosure, though. Well, it's about as official as I think we're probably going to ever get, because, I mean, they're admitting that, yeah, they saw a few UFOs, you know, but, and they don't think that they're from, um, you know, here on Earth. Well, <clears throat> the thing about with Bigfoot, I mean, how are you going to explain the possibility of maybe these things all this time have been responsible for taking people? And and then you all of a sudden admit, oh, well, uh, we've known about this all along, but we just didn't bother to tell anybody about it, you know. So You know, here's, um, here's the thing, though. Uh, like when you mentioned UFOs and, and how people would react. And, and, you know, everybody, of course, theorizes about this stuff. And, yeah, you know, the stuff gets put out, you know, through the sources you mentioned. And there was sort of a big yawn. But I think it's a different matter if all of a sudden there's a bunch of ships, you know, floating over cities. And, and everybody is seeing one. I, I think there's sort of a you know, in this day and age, kind of a disconnect with what we see on television or the Internet versus it being right in front of you. Well, yeah, but that's kind of the same thing with Bigfoot. I mean, people that are living in the city, there's a total disconnect with them. And the people that that live out in the country, well, I mean, yeah, there's some people in the city that have, I guess, where they've come into, uh, you know, close into city locations, but... uh, I mean, like myself, I mean, I, did, I just don't go around telling anybody and everybody that, you know, what I've seen, because uh, most of them are going to think I'm a nutcase. But uh, um, I think that's true you know, with most people. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I don't think I'm, I'm, I'm a novelty in that area, but, uh, um, but on the same token, I, I kind of see the same type of response with, Big, but of course now they may be like they are all up in Oklahoma. They may all of a sudden start saying, "Well, we're going to put a, a bounty on their head and <laughs> you know go out and start hunting them." That that so, whole thing was just silliness, isn't it? Well, <clears throat> it, yes, it was silliness. I think so, but you know, there's a lot of silly people in this world. Will you know that? <laughs> well, we're still talking about when if we find one on us and put it on a slab, right? Yeah, Is that, yeah. Well. I think it's going to be like the California gold rush. I think you're going to get crazy people going out there in the woods, try to get one, and then try to do whatever. All right, we're going to stop here. Great questions, everybody. Um, We love to have listener questions. There's no question that's wrong. And uh, send them to questions at creekdevil.com. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G, at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open.